Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Hello and welcome to our new short format servings of consciously prepared brain food designed to improve your mental fitness. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen, your host. For more than 12 years, we've been proudly and consistently crafting harvesting happiness and sharing it with you. Each week, we spotlight diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. We invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Alrighty then, let's dive in. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are. Thanks for joining us on today's show where you will learn how to sleep well how high-quality rest will change your life. My guest is Dr. Pedram Navab, who is a board-certified neurologist and sleep medicine specialist who is also a fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. He has over 15 years' experience in diagnosing and treating a variety of sleep disorders. After earning his medical degree from Western University of Health Sciences, he completed a neurology residency at the University of Arizona. Subsequently, Dr. Navab trained as a fellow at the Stanford Sleep Center, where he was trained in CBTI and completed a variety of research projects. He later attended Loyola Law School in Los Angeles, where he specialized in health law and intellectual property. And Dr. Navab is in the house to talk about his book, Sleep Reimagined, The Fast Track to a Revitalized Life. Welcome, Dr. Navab. All right. Thank you for having me, Lisa. It is a pleasure. A pleasure. Talk a little bit about your background, because <laughs> this is an interesting confluence of degrees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, neurology is something that I was interested in in med school because the brain, although we, we know what it really does, we don't know the intricacies of it to an extent that we do with the heart or the other organs. So I always thought that was fascinating. And sleep in particular, because we know so much little about it, at least, you know, when I graduated from, from med school, we know a little bit about it now, which is what I'll be discussing. So those two things really excited me about sleep. And I did a little bit of work on Freud and dream analysis, which sleep has kind of veered away from people are coming back to dreams again. But that's sort of what interested me about the two neuro and sleep. And they're so connected to one another. So it was exciting. And then over there, on the other side, you've got law. Yeah, and law was sort of interesting in a way. I always wanted to go to law school. I was an English and film major in college, which is not your traditional route to med school. And I always felt like law is something that I should do. And when I did it, I actually did a lot of forensic law stemming from some of the sleep disorders. Um, Like, for example sleepwalking and kind of violence stemming from that. So I did a lot of expert witnessing case on on those as well. So forensic law within law and health law was really interesting as well. Ooh, I bet Um, you've got great stories. Molding your interest. Yeah, yeah, there was yeah uh, some interesting cases that I saw over the years. Let's talk about the prevalence of insomnia and and why sleep is so important to our health and our performance. Yeah, so there's so many different sleep disorders, but my book really focuses on insomnia and the imitators of insomnia. Some patients think they have insomnia, but when we explore further, we realize their insomnia stems from advanced sleep phase syndrome, delayed sleep phase syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg, PLMS, sleepwalking. So all of these things are actually in the book that I'm writing, but the governing picture really is problems going to sleep and staying asleep. And the book that I've written, Sleep Reimagined, uh, The Fast Track to a Revitalized Life, really talks about insomnia and the imitators of insomnia such as legs, advanced and delayed sleep phase syndrome, PLMS, sleepwalking, 
and how those really are about difficulty going to sleep and staying asleep and patients thinking that they have insomnia, but they actually have these other diagnoses. And the book really focuses on that, which other books sort of have not touched upon. They really focus on, on insomnia without realizing there's so many other diagnoses that are in play. Uh, but getting back to insomnia in general, about 15 to 30% of people have chronic insomnia, which is basically problems going to sleep, staying asleep, or waking up too early for three months and feeling excessively sleepy because of that. And some numbers show that everybody experiences insomnia at least some of the time, 40% of the time as well, less than three months. So it is a very prevalent problem, not only in the U.S., but other countries as well. So what I hear you saying, Dr. Sure. Nabob, is that there is a huge prevalence of chronic insomnia in developed countries. Oftentimes, though, the insomnia is a, is a mask for other disorders. And so many of us suffer with insomnia chronically. You write in your book, Sleep Reimagine, the Fast Track to a Revitalized Life. You talk about ditching sleep disorders in a relatively short period of time. And I would love for you to share with our listeners a little bit about that, because it's it's quite short when you think about it. Yeah, definitely. So as you know, a lot of patients resort to sleep medications because it works relatively quickly and they go to sleep and some stay asleep. But the problem is the sleep architecture becomes disrupted. Although you are actually going to sleep, you're not getting the quality of sleep. And furthermore, when you wake up, you become drowsy and somnolent. So the American Academy of Sleep Medicine realized that cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is really the gold standard and the most effective long-term for patients who have insomnia. And that's what the book discusses really in detail, stemming from my fellowship at Stanford Sleep Disorders Clinic, where we actually ran a sort of four to six week CBTI class composed of about eight participants. And so during those ensuing weeks, and the, chap the, the chapters in the book relay that, you know, the first week, second week, third week, and so forth about the physiology of sleep because people have to understand what they're doing. So in order to understand that, they need to know what sleep is, how the architecture works, different stages, circadian rhythm. So that would be like the first week. The second week would start getting into sleep hygiene techniques, which most people know now and it's not that effective, but you still have to have that. So the book discusses that in, in brief detail. But really, the two big components of CBTI are sleep restriction, so sleeping less to actually sleep more. That's something that is difficult for a lot of people to understand because <laughs> we're basically telling them, don't sleep, but you're going to sleep better in the long term. And then cognitive restructuring, which is very important because when people try to go to sleep or stay asleep, they constantly ruminate about what they have to do the next day, any traumatic things that have happened to them, work-related, any stressors, which we all have. And certainly the news today doesn't <sighs> help anything. And then, you know, they get on their iPhones, they start scrolling and the blue light from the phone. So there's so many things going on. But the two main tenants really are sleep restriction and cognitive restructuring, which I really discuss in the book in some detail. So you could really get that into about four weeks, usually it takes about six, but you can definitely implement that within that time frame. And when you talk about sleep restriction, are you saying that you put yourself to bed at the same time each night, whether or not you go to sleep or not, because you may not fall asleep? on command or on demand and you, you restrict, exactly. yeah, you restrict the a number of hours and you get up at the same time each day and then eventually forces a change to our body clock. Yeah, exactly. So you made a great point, Lisa, in terms of you can't command yourself to go to sleep. And a lot of 
patients try to do that. They try to go to bed at 8 p.m. thinking they're going to fall asleep at 8 p.m. Or the sooner they go to bed, they're going to have more opportunity to fall asleep. But that's very dangerous because what you're doing, you're establishing a cue between not being able to fall asleep in bed and the bedroom environment. So it's kind of like a Pavlovian um, association. So what you're trying to do is to determine initially how many hours the patient is really in bed and how many of those hours are they actually falling asleep. Most realize that their sleep efficiency is like time in bed and time, time asleep over time in bed is actually very low. So what you're trying to do is consolidate it so when they're in bed, they're actually sleeping. And in order to do that, you have to sleep restrict them. So they go to bed later. And the reason they would do that is so they can increase their homeostatic drive to sleep, which is sort of explained really well in the chapter. It may be a little bit difficult to explain here, but as we go about our waking lives, we build this compound called adenosine in our brain. It's a natural anesthetic. And the more we you do our daily activities and don't sleep, the adenosine builds up in our brain to the point where we will at some point naturally sleep because of this buildup of adenosine. And when we actually fall asleep, that adenosine decreases. And then we start back up again where the adenosine increases to the point where it reaches a certain limit so that we can fall asleep. So everybody will fall asleep because you have to. It's just in our brains, just like we have to eat, right? When we get hungry, yeah. we eat, we get satiated, and we start that process again. So we're really working with the body when we do the sleep restriction. It's just not something that we're trying to throw on to the patient so they sleep less. Although in the beginning, they will feel worse before they feel better. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll continue the conversation with my guest today, Dr. Pedram Navab. We're talking about his book, Sleep Reimagine: the Fast Track to a Revitalized Life. To learn more, please connect with Dr. Navab on Facebook at pedram.navab or on Instagram at dr.navab. Here comes the break. We'll be right back. Wait, wait, wait. Before we pause, I want to talk about an astounding statistic. Did you know that tens of millions of Americans experience thinning hair? It's common, even normal, and not widely spoken about, making the experience scary and stressful, which just adds to the entire problem. Hair loss can be caused by several factors like metabolism, stress, lifestyle, genetics, aging, and hormonal shifts like menopause. Nutrafol goes beyond genetics to target the factors impacting your hair growth. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement that's clinically shown to improve hair growth, thickness, and visible scalp coverage for men and women. Thanks to Nutrafol, I've grown fuller, healthier, and happier hair from the inside out. Now is the time to have lovelier locks and better well-being with Nutrafol. Start by visiting Nutrafol.com to take the hair wellness quiz for customized product recommendations. Thinning is different for men and women. Nutrafol has multiple unique formulas for men and women to provide exactly what they need based on their biology and age. Every formula is physician formulated using natural medical grade ingredients for reliable results that I have experienced firsthand. Nutrafol is also trusted and recommended by more than 3,000 top doctors. In clinical studies, 72% of men saw more scalp coverage and 86% of women saw improved growth after six months of youth. What I love most about Nutrafol is that in addition to beautiful hair, the ingredients help me get a handle on better sleep, stress response, skin, and nails. Who wouldn't want that? Join me and millions of others who are standing up for our strands with Nutrafol. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code HAPPINESS to save $15 off your first month subscription. This is their best offer anywhere, and it's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time. Plus, free shipping on every order. Get $15 off at Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code HAPPINESS. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. What is, what is you? 
Research tells us that happiness is good for our health. Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for nutritious helpings of positive goodness. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one, and at times we all need a little support. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and at the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com to explore experiential online and on-site optimal lifestyle management consulting services, including recovery fortification and life crisis triage. And we're back continuing the conversation about sleeping well, how high-quality rest will change your life. Let's get back to the conversation with my guest, Dr. Pedram Nawab. So Dr. Nawab, I'd love for you to take us through the architecture of sleep. Explain to us about the sleep cycle and then also explain to us secondarily how we can set ourselves up for successful sleep. Sure, sure. That sounds good. And again, all of this is explained in the book in the second chapter. Uh, The book is actually divided into narratives of, of patients who can't sleep and how they combat their sleep. Through the narratives, we discuss all that. And the second part of the book is actually the manual for cognitive behavioral therapy. Two books in one. You can start with the second part and then go to the first and whatnot. But with regard to the physiology of sleep, we do have four stages of sleep. Before, there were actually five stages of sleep, if you count REM. About 15 years ago, the Academy decided that two of the stages of sleep were sort of similar, and they combined them. So now we have stage one, two, three, and then REM sleep. So stage one sleep is really just comprised of 5%. It's just an introduction to sleep. You're basically transitioning from wake to sleep. And the waves are fairly similar to wake. I mean, you see a little bit of slowing down of the waves. And these are EEG waves, the waves of the brain. Um, It's about 5%. It's really segued into stage two sleep, which compromises the most amount of sleep, about 45% or so. It's, again, trying to go into a deeper stage of sleep. We know with stage two sleep, there are not a lot of benefits with it. And a lot of patients who do not feel well rested and feel like they haven't slept have spent the majority of their time in stage two sleep. You're easily arousable there's really no benefits per se to it. It's just basically taking you into stage three sleep where you see the most benefits. Stage three sleep is called slow wave sleep because the waves are slow. The body is in a calmer state. Uh, Memory is consolidated in the stage three sleep. And in particular, it's declarative memory. And declarative memory is just memory of remembering things like conversations you've had, things that you've learned in school and you're trying to consolidate for an exam, that's declarative memory. And that's really where the components of stage three are so important is for that memory consolidation. And with regard to slowing of the heart and more of the protective mechanisms for the different organs, stage three is really built for that. Now, stage four or REM sleep, I should say, is rapid eye movement. And in this stage of sleep, if you open someone's eyes, their their pupils are kind of darting back and forth. It's very strange. And you can't really move your body per se, except for your diaphragm. And that's a protective mechanism because in REM sleep, you are dreaming the most vividly. And that's a protective mechanism. So you don't act out your dreams and injure someone. There is a a disorder called REM behavior sleep disorder where that mechanism becomes awry and you actually act out your dreams. There can be potential for violence. And I've been involved in some of those cases. But it really is to serve for procedural memory consolidation. And that's where you gain memory from doing things like changing the tire or doing certain tasks. So procedural memory is really what's prominent in REM sleep. And those are the benefits. And then again, there's just physiological benefits to 
those two stages of sleep in particular. And is muscle repair and healing in the body going on in three or three and four? Yeah, so mainly in stage three or slow wave sleep, that is where the repair is occurring. It's also recurring in REM sleep, but for the most part, it's slow wave sleep is where the tissue repair, wound repair is occurring. Also in slow wave sleep is where you're secreting growth hormone, which is very important for children because in that stage of sleep, you are actually increasing the growth hormone so they can grow and become bigger and taller. Uh, We do find in kids that sleep apnea disrupts that stage of sleep. So they really don't get into that stage three sleep and they don't grow as much. So a lot of children go to the endocrinology clinic thinking that maybe their hormone is awry, but we later learn that it's really (laughs) sleep apnea that's making them not grow. And so they remove the tonsils and the adenoids and we see a growth. So all parents should really look out for that, especially if the child is irritable and not paying attention at school. They're labeled as having ADHD, where we realize is actually sleep apnea in kids, which is very different than in adults. In adults, it, the patients are very tired and groggy. In children, it manifests in irritability and frustration. That's fascinating. Different. Yeah, exactly. Really fascinating. Let's talk about how we can set ourselves up for sleep success in terms of sleep hygiene and sort of preparing through ritual to power down and get ready, you know, for the Sandman. Sure, exactly. So I have like a certain tips that I tell my patients to adhere to. One of them is really to anchor their bedtime. And the reason I want them to do that is not only to get into a rhythm of sleep is really all about getting into a rhythm and doing things methodically and not just sleeping whenever and whatnot. So anchoring the bedtime is great because you do have control over when you wake up. You don't really have control over when you fall asleep, like Lisa alluded to, but you do have control over waking up. And that's very important because it, it, you know, it shows a person that they can do this. So you'd set an alarm clock away from you, preferably not a phone, an analog clock way away so you don't see the time, but set the alarm, wake up at the same time each morning. And what that does, it increases your homeostatic sleep drive. So although you may be tired when you wake up, you know, and some people are, especially if they've only slept, you know, four or five hours, but that prepares you because at that moment on, the brain is increasing the adenosine level and it will make you naturally fall asleep faster the next day. But you have to wake up at the same time each morning to anchor that time. On weekends, you can give yourself about a half hour uh, leeway. So you have, you know, maybe an extra 30 minutes going out or whatnot, but really adhere to anchoring the, the wake up time and waking up at the same time each morning. The second tip would be taking a warm bath or going to a jacuzzi at night. Now, in order for our body to sleep or for us to sleep well, we have to have a cool environment and our body has to generally cool off. So you're asking me, why would I want to take a warm bath or a jacuzzi when my body's getting warm? And the key is not to take a shower. The the shower actually can have opposite effects because it signifies that you have to get ready for work or or the day. But immersing your body in a warm bath, when you come out of the bath, your body cools tremendously. So it's that kind of gradient of rapid cooling that makes your body cool So you fall asleep easier and stay asleep easier. So if you can, take a warm bath an hour before you go to bed or a jacuzzi. So that's number two. Three is if you're in bed and you have anxiety and you can't fall asleep, what you should do, and um, Dr. Wow, who I'm a fellow right now, also in an integrative medicine program at the University of Arizona with Dr. Wow, he tells us to do the four, seven, eight breathing technique. Mm. And that is basically inhaling four, you know, count to four, inhale, keep it for seven seconds, and then 
exhale slowly at eight for eight seconds. And what that does, it helps the body become more relaxed because it increases your parasympathetic tone, which is your relaxed tone. It's not the fight or flight sympathetic tone. Um, so that helps a lot with just your heart rate and your relaxation and studies and out. Get your phone out, get your light out, get your alarm clock out. Uh, you could have a, a, an analog clock, like I said, away from you. Never look at the time when you wake up in the, in the middle of the night. That is just, you're setting up yourself for failure because that just reinforces the fact that you're not falling asleep. So it makes your anxiety even worse. And people look at their phones, checking their emails. That just brings you back to reality. What you need to escape from reality. So a lot of studies suggest actually reading a novel before going to sleep actually helps you sleep faster because you're imagining yourself in a different air, you know, different place with different characters and you're getting yourself away from the reality of your life. You know, if there's any, anything going on. That's my sleeping pill. Yeah. Yeah. Reading a novel <laughs> five, usually you, five pages and I'm done. <laughs> yeah. And it's great, but don't read the news. Don't look at no. your phone to do that. Make it a zone-free sanctuary. Get all the electronics out. It's going to be difficult for a lot of people. I have had so many resistance to this, but if you do it, you won't be you won't be sorry. It'll be the best sleep that you've gotten. So that's a great. The bedroom question. should be for two things, right? Right, right. Sleep and sex for sure. Right, that's and it. if you have more sex, you'll sleep better. <laughs> Right, right, That's exactly. A fact. Because of the, yeah, <laughs> that is a fact, right? Uh, you're secreting hormones that will make you fall asleep faster. Uh, that's definitely true. But that is a, a big thing. But I'm hoping most people know that already. But they're just very resistant to it. You'd be surprised, right? If you're really anxious, it diminishes your sex drive, right? If you're not sleeping yeah. well, it diminishes your sex drive, and it's sort of counterintuitive, right? Yeah, yeah. And you know, when you don't get enough sleep, we talked about, we haven't really talked about the benefits of sleep, but obviously memory, uh, consolidation of memory, immune function, people who sleep less tend to get a tendency to get more infections and not have tissue repair. And, and more studies have shown that you gain weight the less you sleep because you crave carbohydrates when you wake up. You're just not eating well when you sleep less. Another study that just recently came out showed that a sliver of light can affect your sleep. So I tell my patients to wear a big eye mask because even if they, even if they think the room is super dark, they're still getting a little bit of light. So get a big, big eye mask that covers everything. And that like a been, diva. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's some masks like drowsy and uh, drowsy is good because it's got silk and it's just comfortable. But you don't want it to be too tight or too hot because, again, temperature is a really big issue when you're going to sleep. You want something cool, not so cool, especially if you run, if you like the warm temperature, but enough where you feel comfortable. We are out of time, and I want to urge our listeners to learn more by buying the book, Sleep Reimagined, The Fast Track to a Revitalized Life, authored by my guest today, Dr. Pedram Nawab. To learn more, please connect with him on Facebook at pedram.nawab and on Instagram at dr.nawab. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and uh, helping to lull us to better sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was a pleasure, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen and my guest, Dr. Pedram Nawab, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from our mental muscle toning libraries at HarvestingHappinessTalkRadio.com, Toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about my global consulting services, please visit 
HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mangeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Gus, in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.